you think Unilever liked about this acquisition? You know, what channels did they see to expand? What, what do you think that looks like when they come to the table and they say, hey, you know, we want to buy K-18? What, what does that look like from their perspective? Yeah, so I go back to my framework for how to prepare for an acquisition. And in my experience, you need three things for that to work. You need to, one, be a profitable business, which they, they checked, way to go. Uh, you need to have some sort of level up capability, uh, whether it is a marketing channel, whether it is a distribution relationship, assets you own. In this particular case, uh, it was it was patents. And the third part is it needs to be needs to be an easy win. Uh, so something where Unilever can look at this and say, hey, if we paid a billion dollars for this thing now, how do we get this brand itself to generate a billion dollars in revenue in the next two or three years? And so with uh, with K eighteen, I think that there was a lot that that they could have liked. So I'll just, you know, they're profitable. I don't need to say more about that. But really digging into <clears throat> their their plus one capabilities. So they they had a very deep inroads with the professional stylist network. Uh, so they were pro first, which meant that uh, for the longest time, you could only get it through professional hairstylists. You could only get it in salon. Uh, they had that deep network. Um, and so like that cult following was, was really something that was there. What's most interesting was the patents around the hair repair. Uh, because not only does, does Unilever require a business that can continue to grow in and of itself, but they now have the ability to take this K18 peptide and put it into Tresemme, Nexus, uh, you know, Dove, Suave, like anything they wanted to do, they could do that in all of their other hair care products, which means that they're fundamentally have the opportunity to be much better than anything else in the market. And so that that is something that probably in itself was worth uh, several hundred million dollars. Uh, that was was there. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really unique angle. I mean, I think you know Unilever has such a distribution powerhouse that they can get this product in so many more places than any independent brand could. So I think that's number one. And what I've seen with other brands that Unilever has acquired is they really focus on expanding distribution and expanding that brand's reach. So I think that's a key element. And I think, like you said, you know, the patented formula that K18 has stood out. And really resonated with a lot of stylists and and females and even males that care about their hair. So I think that that is a huge step. Um, and I, and I think too, like they are probably going to continue to expand their SKUs, right? I mean, Unilever has such a uh, strong scientific based team when it comes to you know product expansion that I'm sure they're going to continue to expand their SKUs. Um, but it is remarkable to think about K18 really only had like six SKUs to get to that yeah. point of 200 million in revenue, which is just insane to think about. I mean, that's incredible, especially from a supply chain perspective to not have to deal with hundreds of SKUs and only have like about six key ones. That is amazing. Um, and so I think, you know, now with the Unilever, they're definitely going to be expanding SKUs. And I mean, look, it's a super strong margin category, right? I mean, even if you think, okay, K18, they're paying more for their, you know, patented formula at the end of the day, you know, any kind of liquid or shampoo or gel or supplement has an extremely high margin profile in general compared to other categories. So I think that was super attractive too, in terms of like, okay, you know, this is a category that we know we can win in because the margins are high and Unilever already does so much in this category. More so, I think on kind of the, you know, mid to lower end, but this now is kind of like their premium brand that they're probably going to, you know, really put a lot of power and, and energy behind. Yeah, Unilever is interesting because they have uh, their Unilever Prestige Group. And so it, it's um, companies like Dermalogica, Murad, uh, that they've acquired and, and are kind of keeping a little bit separate that are this, this premium piece. And so uh, this probably slides in under there um, for, for that piece. But, you know, I think the other thing that's very interesting that we can learn from K18 are about the things that they didn't do. And so, you know, they didn't raise a whole lot of money. As you mentioned, they only raised $25 million. They could have probably raised four or five times that, um, but they, they basically raised what they needed probably to fund inventory and some expansion, uh, but they allowed themselves to be acquired for only, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying about a billion, but who knows how close it was. Um, had they raised $200 million, million, the exit multiple must have been much higher in order for those investors to make their money back. And so they were, they were disciplined there. And then the other thing that was interesting is while they opted to be in salons and expand internationally, uh, they didn't really expand into retail, um, really beyond Sephora. And so, 
you know, one of the things I think is interesting for an acquirer like Unilever, Unilever to look at this is they have such strong relationships with Target and Walmart and other mass distributors that that's probably something in the back of their mind, like, hey, we could probably do something in this space uh, to to really grow this. And, you know, there may not be that many Walmart shoppers that want to spend 70 bucks on a, uh, on a hair treatment, um, but there's that number is also not zero. And so there's that's another way that they can kind of look at that math uh, to make a, make a billion dollars just justified.